from you know Lamentations. Uh, we'll talk about Jeremiah a little bit tonight because this kind of leads up to Daniel since Jeremiah predicts uh, through the Holy Spirit the, the exile that Daniel's in. Um, Jeremiah also writes you know, Lamentations, obviously, and that book's about uh, mourning or, or lamentation uh, about a, a, a biblical kind of sadness that's supposed to remind the people that they're not... Uh, they're not in the, the full expression of God's kingdom yet. They're not supposed to be satisfied or comfortable with the world. Uh, not that there's anything wrong, per se, with, with any type of you know, comfort or just general contentment, but that it's, uh, we're supposed to be reminded that this is not, not heaven on earth, not uh, the Lord's kingdom uh, fully expressed yet. And, uh, so that you know would have been on their minds at that time and in Daniel. Um, so we're going to be in Daniel 1. Uh, quick note, uh, as we say, so the title is Entering Exile, but I wanted to do a, a quick note, uh, just some review over what, what Danny said, which was really good, you know, this over, flyover uh, last week. Um, just on authorship and date, you know, for 1,800 years, the church didn't have to, to deal with these, these questions until uh, radical skeptics decided to come in and question the historicity of the Bible, not based on evidence, uh, but based on wrong presuppositions, and then they, you know, kind of found the evidence they were looking for, even though it can be proven not to be true. But, uh, but just quick you know, notes, there have been books written on this stuff, but number one, and this is stuff Danny said, but let me just sum it up in like two or three points. Jesus affirmed that Daniel was written by Daniel. Now, of course, that's a little bit uh, circular, but it's not viciously circular. It's that Jesus, you know, is our authority, and he, he says in Matthew twenty four fifteen, it's written by the prophet Daniel. So we believe it's historical, and it was written by Daniel. Uh, Ezekiel mentioned Daniel, which, uh, if the argument that it is that Daniel's around 167 A.D., written by some unknown uh, B.C., written by some unknown person, uh, how does Ezekiel, who's around this the time in the five six to five hundreds, how would he know about Daniel? He mentions Daniel in Ezekiel 14, 14, and 20 as a righteous uh, individual. So they probably knew each other and interacted at some point. Uh, author of Daniel, Daniel shows historical knowledge of the Persian period that's too precise and accurate for someone who was living 200 years uh, later. Uh, it's also written in an ancient form of Hebrew and Aramaic that would have been impossible to duplicate. Imagine trying to write uh, in today's vernacular, trying to copy uh, Shakespeare, you know, and say, okay, well, this is actually a Shakespearean text from 1500 something, and uh, it, it would get caught. It would be anachronistic. Um, that's a flaw, by the way. You can also notice in like books like the Book of Mormon, it's it's a book trying to imitate King James English as an ancient text, and, and it's obvious. Um, Daniel has Persian loan words in it that are so ancient, it's not even clear what they mean, and uh, so, and. Um, as an external evidence, the Bible, uh, later on in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran text, they discovered in 167, a text in 167 AD that mentioned Daniel, which meant that uh, if they already knew about it at that time, Daniel had to come before, and if the Jews already accepted Daniel, Daniel had to come a long time before, and because by that time the Jews knew that the canon was closed. So anyway, but that's just to throw out there just to talk about, you know, just the, the presuppositions of um, other worldviews to, to question um, the ultimate authority of the Bible. That's always been around, but it's in a different way uh, now. And unfortunately, a lot of scholarship um, follows that. You kind of have to be with it in that, that camp to be taken seriously, even though it doesn't have the, the evidence for it. So you can see the kind of biases in that. Um, but also, you know, the claim, um, you know, the, how do we know the Bible is the word of God? Just back to the basics a little bit. Uh, and the reality is that only true knowledge and revelation can come from the God of Scripture, who gives 
gives knowledge, who defines knowledge, who defines truth, that we can't escape um, that reality, and that all other worldviews are inconsistent. They fall apart um, internally because they are not uh, aligned with the God of truth. Only the, only the God of scripture uh, can make sense of the real world, human experience, these real things, and uh, we can only know those things because of revelation from God. For example, even knowledge itself, if we think back, you know, in our minds, like to our most basic fundamental, you know, things, um, facts are always connected with other facts, and so there has to be, you know, an omniscient, true uh, God who has revealed himself and, and to even know truth at all. Uh, and he's revealed himself in, in the Bible. And so we know that to be uh, the case, and only the biblical worldview uh, can make and sustain those claims. Um, I wrote down a couple uh, kind of worldviews that are common today, just to show a little bit, just undo them a little bit, just so because there's so much challenge around the the from the external on the book of Daniel, but I just want to show it rests on a really firm foundation, just as the rest of the Bible does. But uh, a lot of the the worldviews today, the the religions of today, are uh, one empiricism, the idea that of we just look at the, the evidence, we, we follow the evidence where it goes, and the evidence is what proves the case. Um, empiricism is a worldview that's self-refuting, it falls apart because you have to assume something in order to prove it. So you have to assume that everything, that all knowledge comes from observation, but you can't observe that, so it either isn't true or it's uh, circular reasoning, it's begging the question. So we can't, yes, we can observe things, and we can observe truth, but that's because we have a standard from the God of truth. Uh, rationalism, the idea that human reason is the, the final and ultimate uh, authority, uh, but then you have to you know, trust, you have to use human reason to affirm that human reason is the final authority. So again, it's assuming something, uh, not proving something. So that falls apart as well. Skepticism of, you know, questioning everything, but then you're, you're having to question yourself, all these other things, um, and it may not even really matter then at that point because you're still having to use uh, the rules of God's world. Reason, logic, truth, knowledge, you, you know, all those things that we have to assume. And the naturalism that the world is, that everything's just a product of natural phenomenon, um, which in that case, there is no uh, truth in the abstract sense, that it's just, we're just a product of natural uh, and physical reactions, and this discussion is meaningless and has no, you know, has no point. There is no truth. Like, my uh, statement that the Bible is true is a physical, chemical reaction, and someone else's statement that the Bible is not true is a physical and chemical reaction. There's no... Uh, debate. There's no question. There's no truth there. It's just, uh, it's a worldview that, that disintegrates. Um, and so you see how these all fall apart. These are kind of the modern world. Um, but only the Bible, the Word of God, provides that explanation, um, whether we want to believe it or not, of, you know, the God who uh, we know, and we as Christians have uh, been made alive by the Holy Spirit, we follow that God, we, we submit to that God and his kingdom, um, and, and we bow to that truth. And so that's what we're looking at uh, tonight. But let's look at uh, verses 1 and 2. I, I just wanted to get some of that, you know, just groundwork laid. You know, I think it's good every once in a while to come back to just those basic uh, questions of, you know, why do, we, why do we believe the Bible? You know, it's, why do we come back to, as uh, adults, studying this book that we heard in Sunday school, you know, that, uh, because it's God's word. Uh, and so anyway, let's look at uh, the setting of exile, verses 1 through 2. Let's read uh, that together. Um, verses 1 and 2 it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim the king of Judah into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them into the land of Shinar, 
to the house of his God or gods, uh, and he brought the vessel into the treasury of his God. Okay, so this is you know a few verses there, but um, a lot's happening. This is a, a major world shifting, worldview uh, shifting event of Israel's uh, exile from the land, deportation under Nebuchadnezzar that's going to have different um, waves and eventually culminate in 586 when the temple is is totally destroyed, torn down. Nebuchadnezzar gets tired of the the rebellion of of, uh, the king as a vassal state and he says, okay, that's it. We're done. Tears the whole thing apart. And uh, in Judaism is never the same. They thought this event, they, they should have known better, but they thought this event was impossible, as we're going to see tonight. And when different kings or kingdoms or tribes went to war with each other, they viewed it in this time as a battle of their, their gods uh, through their nations on earth. And so for the Babylonians, this pagan nation to overtake and be able to deport uh, Jerusalem, Judah, the Jews, and and remove them from the land. In a lot of people's minds, they would have had warrant for thinking their gods had won. The Assyrian gods or the Babylonian gods are, are more, more powerful, that they have uh, been able to conquer Yahweh, the God of Israel, and take him basically into their house. Uh, and, and that's what a lot of the Jews would have understood and be, been shamed uh, by as well. Uh, and so the, really the, the historical background for the book is set up here in this chapter, in these two verses. You know, has the God of Israel failed? Uh, is the Lord not superior to these other gods, but actually inferior to these other gods. And we know intuitively that the the answer is that that's not the case. But, I mean, living in that time with that mindset, with that context, you know, has God failed to bring about his his kingdom? You know, we could even think through that. There's some application in that uh, for us today. Has God failed in bringing about the the kingdom that that he's promised and the way that he said he's going to bring it about? Um, Has he been conquered? By, uh, by other gods. And so this set of verses makes clear that that's actually not the case, that even though they're going into exile, and that may be what it could be misinterpreted as, that's not what is going on. Because what does verse uh, 2 indicate? What's, what's actually happening here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It said, I mean, Daniel lays out very, you know, directly. This is what happened. There was the besiege, this historical event. But the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, along with the vessel. So God is, is behind us. And the, that word there for Lord is not uh, Yahweh. It's, it's Adonai. It's the, the master, the king, the ruler. Uh, God is, is ultimately providentially working behind these events and within these events to produce his will and produce something that he said uh, was going to happen. And so Daniel makes clear it's not failure on God's part. The exile is not weakness on God's part, but it's part of what the sovereign God allowed and ordained to happen uh, to Judah. And so exile is not a surprise to God. And that's what Daniel's going to be writing about that that this is the context, the setting of exile. How do you live faithfully in exile? Which is uh, hugely applicational for us, too, because I don't want to overplay a hand here, but remember 1 Peter uh, ends, you know, it talks about, it begins with sojourners, aliens, exiles. It talks to, you know, the reader as those things, and then ends with she who is in Babylon greets you. Well, how come he didn't say Rome? Well, because he's identifying it with the old language of, of exile. He's saying we're still under this kind of condition of exile until it's 
fully brought to an end with the, the kingdom of Christ, uh, which everything's been accomplished for that to happen. It's just a matter of uh, the Lord's timing now. But anyway, this is what Daniel is, is laying out in his time. It's not a surprise to God, and it shouldn't have been a surprise to Judah uh, either, because God, God warned them of this. Let me read a, a quote here real quick from um, a biblical theologian uh, named Dempster in his book, Dominion and Dynasty. He says, once uh, seen as the resumption of the narrative, remember, so the story's been kind of stopped for a while in biblical history. It's ended with kings. And then uh, you've had the prophets and the writings, and then Daniel picks up a little bit more of the narrative. Uh, it says, once seen as the resumption of the narrative that was suspended at the end of Kings, it has a different function. That is, Daniel has a different function. The theme of exile is explicitly taken up again by the narrative. Viewed against the wider literary horizon, the book begins to answer the narrative question of the destiny of the people of Israel currently in exile. Uh, not only will they be protected from contamination, idolatry, fire, and wild beasts, but, they, uh, but also there are universal salvific implications for the people. Meaning, this is how Daniel's talking about, okay, be faithful in this time of exile because, and then that's where the visions uh, tie in, and ultimately centering the ground, as we heard last week, God's kingdom, God's sovereignty in, in expressed in the Son of Man in uh, Daniel 7. But there should have been a general uh, explana- uh, expectation of uh, exile because uh, they knew their Bible. They, they knew the book of Deuteronomy where God lays before them the blessing and the curse. And the curses in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, uh, 27 and 28 lay out the blessings and curses for obedience to the Lord and to uh, maintain their function as that unique nation, that kingdom of priests and holy nation for God in the land uh, and to have that blessing and to be the blessing to all the families of the earth, all that was tied to their obedience to God in, you know, in the land. And if they did that, they would have produced blessings. But Moses says, okay, I'll go over the blessings, but they're not really going to be relevant for you um, because you're not going to obey. Uh, and he even says, like, you know, if you didn't obey when I was alive, I don't expect you to, I expect you to be even worse after I'm dead. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I'm being a teacher. It's like, uh, how do the kids behave when you're there as the teacher? And then how do they behave when you leave and a sub comes in? You know, it's like, uh, so you can see how that... That is, but Moses was saying that, and he says, so you're going to experience the curses. Um, And he gives them some hope, saying, look, eventually you're going to repent. Eventually you're going to turn. Uh, You need to circumcise your heart. And the question is, well, how? Well, eventually God's going to provide a new covenant. He's going to give a new heart. But uh, that hasn't happened for them yet. So he's going to display the fact that they they can't. uh, They can't produce the blessings in the world that they were supposed to. And so Moses tells them about the curses. The curses increase in intensity, eventually culminating in God will kick you out of the land. God will deport you and exile you to an unbelieving nation who will take you over, capture you, and take you into the land. And there you're going to be forced to worship other gods. You want to worship your idols now in the land? Fine. God will let you be taken into those nations and you'll worship there. And that's how God would... um, cure them in a sense of, uh, of idolatry, which is what this exile does. When they come back into the land, um, their idolatry is more one of worldliness rather than uh, apostasy. They're not turning to other gods. Uh, they're, they're marrying people who worship other gods and you know, aren't caring about God's agenda. Um, so that's idolatry of a different form. But this is what cause them to leave, uh, leave the land. Let me read some selections from Deuteronomy 28. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, 36 and 37 says, The Lord will bring on you and your king, whom you set over you, uh, to a nation which, you neither, uh, nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone. You shall become a whore and a proverb and a taunt among all the people 
uh, where the Lord drives you. Deuteronomy 28, 49, 50. The Lord will bring a, uh, bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who will have no respect for the old and show no favor to the young. So God's, you know, laying out through Moses here in the late, uh, in 1400 BC, this is what's going to happen uh, if you don't obey the Lord. And it's very specific language that uh, is exactly what happens in the Babylonian captivity um, and in the Assyrian captivity that happens to the, the northern kingdom. Anyway, uh, 2852, Deuteronomy 2852, it shall besiege you. So notice the word there, besiege in Daniel 1, 1 and 2. It shall besiege you in all your towns until all your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout your land, and it shall besiege you in your towns throughout your land, which the Lord your God has given you. Uh, 60, verse 63, you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. In verse 64, moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there, there you shall serve gods of wood and stone, which you, neither, uh, which you or your fathers have not known. Okay, so he tells them this, this is going to be the result of the curses, that, uh, the final curse of exile. Um, and then he ends with, uh, or gets close to the end with Deuteronomy 29 and 30, which is God hasn't given you a heart, but he will give you a new heart. Um, and, and then you'll repent and all those blessings will be the reality. Now that's the general. Deuteronomy is the, uh, the constitution. Deuteron- Deuteronomy is the, the sets up the biblical way of thinking and all the definitions um, for the, really for the whole Bible, I, I think. Um, it's it's foundational book. So when you read other books, um, it's usually picking up on, okay, this is the logic from Deuteronomy. This is the way of thinking. So when you see that they're exiled, you're going, okay, they're experiencing the curses of uh, God's law because they failed to obey. Um, and this is now the result. But there's also a more specific reason why they should have expected exile. And that's because uh, Jeremiah is sent by God to, uh, to sue them, basically on behalf of God. The prophets act as uh, God's lawyers in what's called a covenant lawsuit, meaning you've agreed to this document, you've agreed to this covenant, you've agreed to this, uh, this agreement, this, this contract between you and God, defining your relationship and your role and your responsibilities. And the sanctions have been laid out before you, both positive and negative. And the prophet would show up from God to say, look, you have not held up your end of the deal. You have not obeyed the Lord. And therefore, here's what you can expect. And then they would give out, okay, now here's the specifics of what's going to happen to you. And that's what Jeremiah uh, comes about and does in about 627 to 570. So he kind of lives to see, uh, he lives through uh, seeing that exile that uh, occurs in Daniel. Um, can somebody read uh, Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12, and then someone read Jeremiah 29, 10. It's 29, 10, not 29, 11, mm-hmm. but it's close. You'll get the, which one? The latter. Oh, okay. 2910. I'll read 2511 through 12. Okay. 2511 through 12. Okay. So, okay. You can't just, yeah, you can't just select. And, Ab, could you actually do, uh, I forgot there's another one. Uh, can you do Jeremiah uh, 7 4 if you're looking to do one? <laughs> Open to print. Open to print. Open to Okay, and actually I'm going to have, you know what, I'm going to have Danny start. I was going to have Abigail start because it's in order, but uh, you know what, I'll have you guys go and then we'll, we'll go back to this one. It's, you get kind of the funny one. Okay. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. So for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. Uh, oh, I already gave you 20. Okay, yeah, you get it. Okay, uh, Kenton, can you do it? 
25, 11, 12. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. So, pretty specific, also very supernatural, that Jeremiah predicts this uh, beforehand and lays out 70 years and says it's going to be Babylon. Okay, this isn't like saying in 1850, I think there's going to be a civil war in the United States. Now, this is like, this is going to happen by this particular world empire that's going to gain dominance in the world. And it's here's the, the exact amount of time, even after Jeremiah's dead, that Daniel's saying, okay, 70 years is coming to an end. Why I didn't have Daniel read Jeremiah 29, 11, is because Jeremiah says, okay, there's going to be end of the, that 70 years, but there's also going to be a greater return from exile where God's going to bring in the new covenant, change everything. That doesn't happen at the end of the 70 years. And Daniel's sitting around thinking about that in Daniel 9, and he's praying you know, about that. And he's like, Lord, we don't deserve to be forgiven, but it's kind of the end of the 70 years. And this, what you've said in your word hasn't happened yet. And then that's when Daniel gets the, it's, it's going to be longer. It's going to be a 70 sevens, you know, to fulfill the whole thing that Jeremiah 29, uh, 11 and following is talking about. Um, but, so, they, so he gives these, these prophecies that this is going to happen, um, but Israel during this time was so disobedient, and this shows us not, let's look at them and, and just uh, be critical of Israel uh, in their disobedience, but rather, you know, this is, this is the uh, pattern of human sinfulness um, is this this arrogance and really just almost like it's funny like stupidity here um, all right you guys they they sing a song this is so stupid they sing a song um, they thought we could just sin all we want and then go to the temple and it'll all be good and we'll just get it all taken care of and God's not going to care about that um, we can do, we can break God's, no matter what it is. And then we go to the temple, get it all taken care of. And, we, and you know, that's how we think sometimes too. That's how sometimes we uh, treat our sin. And they also thought God's not going to punish us because God's uh, physical manifestation of his kingdom and his presence, we have it. We have God's temple here that was built by Solomon. And there's no way that uh, we could be judged while we're while we have this you know which means remember it gets totally torn down but they didn't think that could happen so they make up this song and um it, it reminds me of two songs it's one is the the muffin man okay you'll see what i'm talking about and the other is is yellow submarine okay uh, can you read uh and you can choose whichever way whichever <laughs> song you want to read that in but read jeremiah 7 4 Anderson. Which one? I, I can just imagine him reading this. Okay, do not trust in deceptive words saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, <laughs> the temple of the Lord. Yeah, so three times. There, it's like, we all live in the temple of the Lord. Or like, do you know the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. The but this is like, and it's funny to us, and it's okay that it's a little bit humorous because you can see but it's the irony there of ah we've got the temple god's uh house and therefore god will never judge our sin we're not going to go into exile that's ridiculous and which is why they uh didn't appreciate when jeremiah came in the temple doorway and said stop singing that because god says i'm tearing this whole place down <laughs> you know basically uh, and, and you're all done. You're all going into exile. And uh, so they didn't appreciate that, that message. And he, and he just speaks from God. He's like, do you really think you can go commit, commit murder, go commit adultery, go commit idolatry, and then come here and say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord? That's how Jeremiah presents it to them. Um, and so that notice, you know, Daniel 1, 2, the, uh, it's not just the king that goes into exile. So this is the end of 
the kingdom for the time being. It's time out for the, the Davidic kingdom, but also for the temple, which is God's kingdom and presence uh, in a physical way. Uh, that, that along with some of the vessels of the house of God are brought into the Babylonian uh, pantheon of their gods. Uh, so this is a big deal. They, they, this would have undone their worldview. Um, they can't sing that anymore. A temple of the Lord, you know, it's, this is uh, the destruction of a temple that's been around for a couple hundred years at this point. It was built by, uh, by Solomon, and they thought it was going to stand uh, forever. Um, so anyway, and Ezekiel talks, you know, his big message is uh, about God's presence um, and the temple and, you know, contemporary to Daniel. So he's experiencing this exile and, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of his unique uh, contribution. And anyway, also notice here, talks about, uh, uses an old term for the Babylonians. It says the land of uh, Shinar. You know, what does that remind us of? Tower of Babel. So it's like everything's been ripped back all the way to the beginning, and Babylon, Neo Babylon, is going to represent basically the first kind of uh, unified rebellion against God that happened at the Tower of Babel. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk said, You're going to be taken over by the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians. Uh, but he calls them that because Abraham, remember, in uh, Genesis. 12 is called out of Ur of Chaldees. It's like, we're going back. Your failure is so complete and utter that we have scaled this thing back to pretty much like pre-Abraham. Though the promises are still all operative. Uh, God's still going to complete all those things. It's just that Israel has not been able to uh, affect those results because of their, their disobedience and idolatry uh, and sin. And so this is the context. Um, and, and you'll notice as we go through these things, um, Daniel and his friends are faithful, but they're not the only Jews there. You know, that's what I think one of the things I, I had a realization of just a few years ago with Daniel is that when they're refusing to be contaminated with the king's food, when they're refusing to bow down to the statue, when Daniel praise. There are other Jews present, and I was going to say believers, and maybe there are, there were, there was a remnant, um, but they're not, uh, they're not being consistent uh, and faithful like, you know, the four in this story. Maybe some of them were. There were obviously Ezekiels and others that we, that we, we know about and probably ones that we don't know about, but, um, you know, you could imagine uh, the bowing down to the golden statue, and when everybody else who you know believes in the God of, supposedly believes in the God of Israel as well, or is scared, and you know it's up to you to to stand uh, in faithfulness to the Lord, um, or just to say, okay, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't mean it in my heart, even though I really bowed down, or you know what what you would do in that situation. Uh, but let's look at Daniel and his friends. Uh, does somebody want to read Daniel 1, uh, 3 through 7? All right. Okay, it says, The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace and to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time they were to serve in the king's court. Among them, from the descendants of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them other names. He gave the name Belshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Yeah, thank you. And so that, and Kenton has commented on this. We were talking about how 
Daniel's called Daniel. You know, we know Daniel as Daniel, and that's the name of the book, obviously. He's pretty much called that throughout the book. But we know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, but the names are important. So imagine being named after um, pagan gods, you know. Uh, now, they, they went with it in the sense that, like, that was one thing, but they weren't going to uh, fail in, you know, other moral ways, you know, that's uh, kind of interesting in Esther, going through on Sunday mornings, Esther's her Persian name, named probably after the Persian or uh, Assyrian god uh, Ishtar, which is uh, a Persian like star god or goddess, um, and her Hebrew name is Hadassah, and that's only mentioned once, so it gives you a little bit of like a, you don't want to make too much of it, but names are important in the Bible, and a little bit of a clue as to, okay, but there's some differences between Daniel and Esther uh, in the sense that she's very much, you know, in that Persian context where Daniel's a little bit more um, purposefully separated from, uh, from the Babylon, Babylonian context, um, as are the other men, but, you know, we kind of know them by, by other names. Okay, uh, so yeah, they... Uh, they take the nobles, and this is a kind of a unique group. Um, Daniel and his three friends are in probably the royal uh, family. Of, they're probably not in the line to the throne or anything, but they're probably within kind of that royal line. It says that they are from, um, you know, they're from the, the region of Judah, but also, you know, that they are, uh, they were searching for men of intelligence and, uh, also of the nobles, so that they could train them in the Babylonian texts, the Babylonian literature, um, and that they could become educated and also serve now Nebuchadnezzar. So, you know, this is a big shift, and now they're going to be uh, challenged, but also asking, uh, asked to learn new things and do new things through this three-year training period. So over the f chapter one, you know, we read it, and it's uh, quick, but there's... Um, three years that take place within this. Uh, it's kind of interesting. If you look at verse 3, it says, you know, something like the, the officials or the nobles or the, the royal family. Um, it says the, the, the literal wording there is the seed of the royal family, uh, which seed is important all, going back all the way to Genesis uh, 3. Um, but it's also talking about, okay, there's still a remnant of people God has, has suspended the Davidic uh, line. It's still going to exist. But what's kind of interesting after this and after the exile is there's really no more kings. Um, and there's, there's priests and there's a temple again that's built uh, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. But it's just not the same. Um, which is, they're commanded to build it, but and God you know, blesses that in its own way. But it's not the same. And they never have a king uh, again, until uh, the Messiah. Let me read uh, Ezekiel 21, 26, and 27. So, as thus says the Lord, remove the turban, meaning this is the turban is what the priests wore. And it was talking about that in, uh, I think, Exodus uh, 28. Remove the turban and take off the crown, meaning priests are done, kings are done. Okay, take away the implements that represent both of those offices. It says, uh, this will no longer be the same. Exalt that which is low and abase that which is high. A ruin, a ruin, a ruin, I will make it. This also will be no more until he comes whose right it is and I will give it to him. Okay, so they're saying no more turban, priests are done, no more crown, kings are done. There's not going to be any more of that until... One who comes, who the Lord's going to give it to, who will unite them. That's the, the Messiah. Um, Zechariah 6, 11 through 15 talks about this as well, that there will be a, a priest on the throne, which you couldn't unite those two offices. Um, but the Messiah, who is God, very clearly from Zechariah, is the one who's able to, to do that. So there's still some hope here, but just interesting reading in Ezekiel that's like, okay, kings are done, priests are done, until... God gives it to someone whose right it is to actually take up both of those uh, those offices. What words Ezekiel again? Uh, Ezekiel 21, 26, and 27. Uh, the, the companion passage with that that's later is uh, Zechariah 6, 11 through 15. 
uh, and Zechariah is a little bit more <coughs> direct because it, Zechariah is kind of putting all the promises of the Old Testament together and, and synthesizing it. Um, let's look at the next point and see their, you know, the test of their faithfulness. Uh, I'll read verses 8 through 16 here to move on. <coughs> it says, but Daniel made up his mind, or, or set it upon his heart, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander and officials, and the commander and official said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths uh, that are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander uh, of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so you still call them by their old names, uh, please test your servants for ten days, and, uh, and let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence, and let uh, the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. Uh, and at the end of the ten days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths uh, who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and wine to drink and kept giving them vegetables. <laughs> so Now, vegetables means uh, you could have grains and stuff too, bread. Um, kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just... Again, this is why I'm thankful I'm a Gentile in the 21st century. But, but anyway, um, now, you can see just the importance of the faithfulness and the details, as well as the, the idea here that, well, look, it's not a big deal. Do you really want to make your hill to die on over food? Which today, granted, like I just said, I'm a Gentile, wouldn't be the thing to, to die over necessarily, Right? But faithfulness in something, the, the details in being faithful to the Lord, that it would have been easy to eat the king's food. It would have been even understandable. I, I wouldn't have been um, too critical of them, of them if they had eaten the food. Because the reality is they're put in a position by force captured and kidnapped to be here. You know, so it's, it's so dietary law could have gone out the window. Um, Esther doesn't seem to have any scruples about this later on. Uh, she marries, you know, there's a, a passage in Esther too, you know, where she's under force, she's under duress. Um, and she goes, you know, into the king's chamber, you know, for the evening, right? She doesn't stand up and say, okay, I'm not going to fornicate or, you know, or whatever, I'm, you know, and risk her life doing that. And we're not saying, you know, good or bad about that right now. And then Esther doesn't, doesn't really focus on that. But you could see just under the, the pressure of that situation, uh, what that would have been like. And... Again, it's not just that the, you're in a foreign land with the, the Babylonians wanting you to participate in this. It's required of you to do this. And there would have been certainly other Jews who would have said, look, this is not, this is not the thing that I want to go down, on, to go down for, eating food. But this, was, this food, was, and it's not just uh, the food, it's... Um, that it was sacrificed to idols, most likely, you know, and that's why they uh, are against the wine as well as probably a burnt libation offering to uh, their gods where they pour out this wine over flames. 
to these other gods. Um, you know, and what if they say, okay, well, I just don't mean that. You know, I don't have anything about that. It's, I, don't, I didn't make a sacrifice to any other gods. It's just me eating the meat, right? Um, but Daniel makes up his mind uh, beforehand about what what he's going to do and what he's not going to do. And what we see with these guys is, is increasing pressure and intensity of the situation. Uh, the next chapter, obviously, after Daniel 1 is Daniel 2, where it's the golden... Uh, well, in Daniel 3 is what I meant. It's the, the golden... Uh, the vision of the statue and then the golden statue. And whether or not the three men are going to bow down to the golden statue. And... You know, now it's gone from eating food that was sacrificed to idols to bow down and worship, you know, this, this idol that represents your king. Um, so anyway, they're, they're under that, that intense pressure there, but they don't give in. And that's kind of what Daniel's writing about. The narrative portions of Daniel is it's worth it to be faithful to God even into death, even in exile because of what the kingdom of the Lord is, is really going to be, because of the kingdom of the hope in the future kingdom of the Lord, that it's even better to forfeit uh, your own life. And that's what, you know, Danny read a, a section of last week that we'll get to in, in chapter 3. They say, look, God can save us even from the furnace. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going forward with this. Um, and God does save them in that case. It wasn't guaranteed necessarily. Uh, it's not guaranteed for us, but that's that's what Daniel's kind of about. He sh- saves them to show, look, God can do all these things, uh, but it's really up to, to God. It's up to us to, to be faithful in the time uh, and situation that we're given, even under that, that pressure. Um, and that's where Daniel's message still applies to us now, you know, what, what we're going to uh, concede to and what we're going to not concede to. Uh, and bow the knee to and not bow the knee to. Um, and, you know, we were in a pretty uh, comfortable position for the most part, uh, not have to have that pressure, but uh, I don't know how long that, that will be. So, we, I mean, you have to kind of think through these things uh, like Daniel beforehand, because it'll be a lot tougher in the midst of that particular situation, uh, whatever it may be. I'm glad Daniel had uh, a few faithful friends with him and that they had each other because I I think as I'm getting a little bit older, I'm seeing the, the pressure of what it would be like to st- really stand alone. Thankfully, I've never really had to stand alone. There's always been somebody who's supporting me, backed me up in, in very limited pressure situations like that where I, where I needed to you know do the right thing for the Lord, but... Um, you know, there's the importance of having those, uh, just knowing those other people exist. Uh, you could imagine what it would have been like for like Elijah when he thinks he's the only one that's not uh, bowed the knee to, to Baal. Um, and God lets him know, there are, no, there are a hundred others in a cave uh, elsewhere who haven't. You're not the only one left. Uh, but, you know, just thankfully they, they, they had each other uh, through these certain things, and hopefully, you know, and that was obviously uh, strengthening for them as well. And then, uh, let me read a, another quote on this. It says, the narrative reflects on the importance of being faithful to God in exile, even during severe persecution. And visions are often termed apocalyptic, sketching out a detailed program for the future of Israel to the end of time. So it's about, the narrative's about uh, be faithful, because here comes the kingdom of God. Now, it may be a matter of waiting, and, and you could even lose your life. But even Daniel 12 talks about the saints are going to be resurrected. It's going to, they're going to participate in the kingdom of God. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the end. And so he says that this is, you know, the Lord is, and his uh, truth are worth, worth even dying for. But Daniel's clever. He comes up with a solution that is uh, workable. And he, he doesn't just say he's not belligerent, he's not rude, he's not, you know, annoying. Uh, 
he doesn't stand on principle for principle's sake uh, per se, but he says, look, you know, I, I can't be defiled by this food, but can you, can you at least give us, test us out, get, allow us this opportunity to avoid these certain things and do, do it our way and we'll still fall in line with the other things you have to say insofar as they could be faithful to the Lord. Um, and that's how, you know, we should be as well, right? You know, as far as going along with things maybe in the world or the workplace, it's like, okay, insofar as we can be faithful to the Lord, we still need to, you know, be those people <clears throat> in the workplace who are uh, fulfilling all that stuff and doing our jobs and trying to go with the program as much as is, is right and appropriate um, so that when it does come to that point of having to stand for principle and say, I can't do this, that, you know, we can, uh, make that stand effectively. Um, it's kind of funny here. It's, uh, this is, this passage was misused, uh, you know what I'm going to talk about? <laughs> it was misused by Rick Warren. He wrote a book called the Daniel Fast, the Daniel Diet or something like that, you know, is uh, uh, Rick Warren, I, I don't think is a believer, but um, he can affirm the right things to the right people at certain times, but I, I don't think he knows the Lord. But anyway, but he, he used this passage to say, hey, you know what? Why don't you try for 10 days vegetables and, you know, and uh, <laughs> so that's a way to... Um, misinterpret scripture, not that there's anything wrong with vegetables or whatever, people want to eat what, what have you, that's fine. But the, uh, it's very important to go from what the intention of the author was of what they're saying and what, that, uh, <clears throat> what the implications legitimately are, right? Daniel was not thinking that people reading this were going to in a diet do some sort of 10-day vegetarian diet in order to, to get the effects that Daniel did, be good looking and all this stuff. It's, uh, it's about Daniel's faithfulness. So we can make a legitimate application and say, okay, faithfulness to God under pressure, under exile, okay, th those truths uh, work you know, for us as well. That's within the range. Um, dietary you know, things here uh, wouldn't be within the range of interpretation. So I just mentioned that just as uh, something for you to be aware of someday, you guys, or uh, me if you haven't already, you'll, you'll have some person coming up to you and talking about something, not probably the Daniel Diet, but something like this, that they'll have read a book, you know, that takes some little section of the Bible out of context, out of interpretation, reads it in some way, and then they say, okay, well, what should we do about this? And you'll have to, you know, gently guide them back to, well, we want to be careful with, with those texts and, you know, and, and read the Bible as, as a, it's meant to be read, not as a dietary book, but as a uh, book about, you know, God's kingdom and, and, and its implications on our lives and the gospel and stuff like that, rather than just finding um, little things, to, details to focus on that aren't the main point. So anyway, but then, so then so, some application there, just and somehow uh, people misuse Daniel. Uh, last, uh, last couple of verses here, let's finish up here. Daniel 1, 17 through 21 says, As for the youths, God gave them uh, knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of dreams and visions. Then at the end of the days, which had been specified for the presenting of them to the commander of the officials, uh, presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of all of, uh, and all, out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding which the king, about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were with them. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. Okay, so Daniel's writing this, and he's probably writing this in 5... 
38, 536, when Cyrus the Persian has come and uh, is going to be the next dominant world empire, the, the Medo-Persian Empire, which Daniel predicts as well. But um, quick note, uh, Cyrus was predicted by Isaiah back in, by name in Isaiah 44, 28 and 45, 1. This was a um, long time before. This is why they, they liberals have to make up, oh, well, there must have been two Isaiahs because there's no way. But, yeah, it's the word of God. And, you know, it's, it, it happened before. All the evidence points to, to a unified author of Isaiah um, and that it was the prophet Isaiah. Uh, but Isaiah, basically, God's message to them there is, you think your gods are so great? Uh, one, you're going to go into exile, okay, as part of that curse, but you think your gods are so great? Let's see your gods that you've made out of your hands tell you what the future is going to be. I'll tell you what the future is going to be. After you've been in exile, I'm going to use this guy, this, this Persian uh, pagan king, Cyrus. I'll call him out by name and declare the end from the beginning. He's going to be the one that's going to shepherd you back home from exile. And that's exactly what happens. Cyrus uh, becomes aware of that, and the Lord works on his heart to, to bring them, to allow Israel to go home. And that's what... Uh, end of Chronicles and beginning of Ezra picks up on is, yep, the Lord was fulfilling that prophecy that the 70 years has ended, according to Jeremiah, and the guy that was called out by name uh, hundreds of years in advance by Isaiah through the Lord has now come and brought home uh, or allowed to go home the, the people. So Daniel is in the middle of that. He goes from the captivity of uh, Babylon all the way through. He sees all these kingdoms kind of rise and fall. And he sees Cyrus and knows that the 70 years has come to an end. Um, and that that's probably near the end of his uh, life as far as we know. And then he, you know, he ends, he has his book written during that time uh, showing that really what's coming is yes, these kingdoms are gonna rise and fall, but it's all really ultimately under the sovereignty and kingdom of God. That's, uh, that's eventually going to crush it like a stone, fill the whole earth, and that's also going to be the, the coming of the, uh, the Son of Man. And all, all nations, tribes, tongues, peoples are going to serve and worship him uh, as the final king in, uh, in world history. And so that's what Daniel is, is uh, kind of the panoramic of what he's looking uh, forward to. But all this sets up with, with chapter 1, um, Daniel's able to interpret those dreams and visions, which the other three are not able to do. Uh, and that's going to set up for chapter two, where that first vision is going to kind of lay out. Here's the end of world history and kind of the path to get there. Um, so anyway, so let's uh, close in a word of prayer. And we will quit here. Lord God, we thank you. Uh, for your word. We thank you for uh, the knowledge of the truth, uh, for you giving us your spirit to recognize the truth uh, and to submit to it. We pray that uh, this time in Daniel uh, will refresh us and bless us, that it will cause us uh, to desire the coming of your kingdom uh, and that it will uh, create in us a desire for faithfulness in the present, even under uh, the situation of uh, continued exile because we know that uh, Christ has come and that he has uh, accomplished everything through his ministry, life, death, and resurrection, and that he will come again, Lord, and bring that kingdom. So, Lord, we uh, pray for that end and we, we look forward to uh, the culmination of all those things in world history in your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.